the famous five. Five on Kirin Island again. Dedicated to Zora and Jazz. Apologies in advance for misreading, repeating myself, and losing the place. Chapter 20 Everything Boils Up Meanwhile, the three boys and Timmy were having a very strange journey underground. Timmy led the way without faltering, stopping every now and again for the others to catch up with him. The tunnel at first had a low roof and the boys had to walk along in a stooping position, which was very tiring indeed. But after a bit the roof became higher and Julian, flashing his torch around, saw that the walls and floor, instead of being made of soil, were now made of rock. He tried to reckon out where they were. We've come practically straight towards the cliff, he said to Dick. That's allowing for a few turns and twists. The tunnel has sloped down so steeply the last few hundred yards that I think we must be very far underground indeed. It was not until the boys heard the curious booming noise that George had heard in the caves that they knew they must be under the rocky bed of the sea. They were walking under the sea to Curran Island. How strange! How unbelievably astonishing! It's like a peculiarly vivid dream, said Julian. I'm not sure that I like it very much. All right, Tim, we're coming. Hello, what's this? They all stopped. Julian flashed his torch ahead and saw a pile of fallen rocks. Timmy had managed to squeeze himself through a hole in them and go through to the other side but the boys couldn't. This is where the spades come in, Martin, said Dick cheerfully. Take a hand. By dint of pushing and shoveling, the boys at last managed to move a pile of fallen rocks enough to make a way past. Thank goodness for the spades, said Julian. They went on and were very soon glad of the spades again to move another heap of rock. Timmy barked impatiently when they kept him waiting. He was very anxious to get back to George. Soon they came to where the tunnel forked into two, but Timmy took the right-hand passage without hesitation, and when that one forked into three, he again chose one without stopping to think for a moment. Marvellous, isn't he? said Julian. All done by smell. He's been this way once, so he knows it again. We should be completely lost under here if we came by ourselves. Martin was not enjoying his adventures at all. He said very little, but laboured on after the others. Dick guessed he was worrying about what was going to happen when the adventure was over. Poor Martin. All he had wanted to do was draw, and instead of that, he'd been dragged into one horrible job after another, and used as a cat's paw by his evil guardian. Do you think we're anywhere near the island? said Dick at last. I'm getting tired of this. Yes, we must be, said Julian. In fact, I think we'd better be quiet as we can, just in case we come suddenly on the enemy. So without speaking again, they went as quietly as they could. And then, suddenly, they saw a faint light ahead of them. Julian put out his hand to stop the others. They were nearing the cave where George's father had his books and his papers, where George had found him the night before. Timmy stood in front of them, listening too. He was not going to run headlong into danger. They heard voices and listened intently to see whose they were. George's and Uncle Quinton's, said Julian at last, and as if Timmy had also satisfied himself that these were indeed the two voices. The dog ran ahead and went into the lit cave, barking joyfully. Timmy, came George's voice, and they heard something overturn as she sprang up. Where have you been? Woof, said Timmy, trying to explain. Woof. 
and then Julian and Dick ran into the cave, followed by Martin. Uncle Quentin and George stared in the very greatest amazement. Julian, Dick, and Martin, how did you get here? cried George, while Timmy jumped up and capered around her. I'll explain, said Julian. It was Timmy that fetched us, and he related the whole story of how Timmy had come to Kieran Cottage in the early morning and had jumped onto his bed, and all that had happened since. And then, in their turn, Uncle Quentin and George told all that had happened to them. So where are the two men? asked Julian. Somewhere on the island, said George. I went scouting after them some time ago and followed them up to where they get out into the little stone room. I think they're there until half past ten, when they'll go up and signal so that people will think everything is all right. Well, what are our plans? said Julian. Will you come back down the passage under the sea with us? Or what shall we do? Better not do that, said Martin quickly. My guardian may be coming, and he's in touch with the other men. If he wonders where I am and thinks something is up, he may call in two or three others, and we might meet them making their way up the passage. They did not know, of course, that Mr. Curtin was even then lying with a broken leg at the bottom of the quarry. Uncle Quinton considered. I've been given seven hours to say whether or not I will give the fellows my secret, he said. That time will be up just after half past ten. Then the men will come down again to see me. I think between us we ought to be able to capture them, especially as we've got Timmy with us. Yes, that's a good idea, said Julian. We could hide somewhere till they come and then set Timmy on them before they suspect anything. Almost before he had finished those words, the light in the cave went out. Then a voice spoke out of the blackness. Keep still, one movement, and I'll shoot. George gasped. What was happening? Had the men come back unexpectedly? Or why hadn't Timmy given them a warning? She had been fondling his ears, so probably he'd been unable to hear anything. She held Timmy's collar, afraid that he would fly at the man in the darkness and be shot. The voice spoke again. Will you, or will you not, give us your secret? Not, said Uncle Quinton in a low voice. You will have this whole island and all your work blown up then. And yourself too, and the others. Yes, you can do what you like, suddenly yelled George. You'll be blown up yourself too. You'll never be able to get away in a boat. You'll all go on the rocks. The man in the darkness laughed. We shall be safe, he said. Now keep at the back of the cave, all of you. I have you covered with my revolver. They all crouched at the back. Timmy growled, but George made him stop at once. She did not know if the men knew he was free or not. Quiet footsteps passed across the cave in the darkness. George listened, straining her ears. Two pairs of footsteps. Both men were passing through the cave. She knew where they were going. They were going to escape by the undersea passage and leave the island to be blown up. As soon as the footsteps had died away, George switched on her torch. Father, those men are escaping now down the sea tunnel. We must escape too, but not that way. My boat is on the shore. Let's get there quickly, before there's any kind of explosion. Yes, come along, said her father. But if only I could get up to my tower, I could stop any wicked plan of theirs. They mean to use the power there, I know. But if I could get up to the glass room, I could undo all their plans. Oh, do be quick then, father, cried George, getting in quite a panic. Save my island, please, if you can. They all made their way through the cave up to the passage that led to the stone flight of steps from the little stone room, and there they had a shock. The stone could not be opened from the inside. The men had altered the mechanism so that it could now only be opened from the outside. In vain, Uncle Quinton swung the lever to and fro, but nothing happened. The stone would not move. It's only from the outside it can be opened, he said in despair. We're trapped. 
They sat down on the stone steps in a row, one above the other. They were cold, hungry and miserable. What could they do now? Make their way back to the cave and then go down under the sea tunnel? I don't want to do that, said Uncle Quinton. I'm so afraid that if there's an explosion, it may crack the rocky bed of the sea, which is the roof of the tunnel, and then water would pour in. It wouldn't be pleasant if we happened to be there at that moment. Oh no, don't let's be trapped like that, said George with a shudder. I couldn't bear it. Perhaps I could get something to explode the stone away, said her father after a while. I've got plenty of stuff. If only I have time to put it together. Listen, said Julian suddenly. I can hear something outside this wall. Shh. They all listened intently. Timmy whined and scratched at the stone, but it would not move. It's voices, cried Dick. Lots of them. Who can that be? Be quiet, said Julian fiercely. We must find out. I know, I know, said George suddenly. It's the fishermen who have come over in their boats. That's why the men didn't wait till half past ten. That's why they've gone in such a hurry. They saw the fisher boats coming in. Then Anne must have brought them, cried Dick. She must have run home to Aunt Fanny, told her everything, and given the news to the fishermen. And they've come to rescue us. Anne, Anne, we're in here. Timmy began to bark deafeningly. The others encouraged him, because they felt certain that Timmy's bark was louder than their shouts. Woof, woof, woof. Anne heard the barking and the shouting as soon as she ran into the little stone room. Where are you? Where are you? she yelled. We're in here. We're in here. Move the stone, yelled Julian. He was shouting so loudly that everyone near him jumped violently. Move aside, miss. I can't see which stone it is, said a man's deep voice. It was one of the fishermen. He felt round and about the stone in the recess. Sure, it was the right one. It was cleaner than the others. It was obviously being used as an entrance. Suddenly, he touched the right place and found a tiny iron spike. He pulled it down and the lever swung back behind it and pulled the stone aside. Everyone hurried out, one on top of the other. The six fishermen standing in the little room stared in astonishment. Aunt Fanny was there too, and Anne. Aunt Fanny ran to her husband as soon as he appeared, but to her surprise he pushed her away quite roughly. He then ran straight out of the room and hurried over to the tower. Was he in time to save the island and everyone on it? End of chapter 20